Science on Surfaces. Hello there and welcome to this podcast. Today we will talk about light interaction with matter and different phenomena that this can give rise to. And we'll also talk about how these different phenomena can be used in various interesting applications. So here with me in this call I have Professor Magnus Jonsson. Uh, Magnus is Associate Professor and Head of the Organic Photonics and Nano Optics Group at the Laboratory of Organic Electronics at Linköping University in Sweden. So welcome Magnus! Thank you very much, glad to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you here on this call. I'm so looking forward to learn more about this topic. Um, so all the research or the work that you do in your group is focused around optical phenomena or light interacting with uh, surfaces or material. Um, so if we start with the basics, what happens when light interacts with the surface of a material? Yes, that's a good question. So uh, quite a lot of, of things can happen. And what we are used to maybe in our daily life is that uh, we see things because light scatters from surfaces. And uh, that can come from uh, that uh, certain material has uh, pigments, like in, in different type of clothes that uh, remove some of the colors so that we see other colors and so on. And then we have uh, other phenomena uh, more like reflection we can have a strong reflection when we are driving and uh, when light hits the surface of the road in uh, when it's a little bit wet for example so we have a specular reflection as it's, it's called and then other phenomena like diffraction and uh, refraction in in water when the light goes from one medium to another and what what we are focusing on in in my group is to control light with, with very small structures or in, instead of having a, a material that have a certain color because it uh, has a material absorption like a pigment or a dye we try to control light by structure instead so we make different thin films or nanostructures and use so-called interference effects and also other effects to create color or to manipulate light uh, at a nanoscale usually. Okay, so, but all, I mean, everything we see must be because light is reflecting back. Yes, reflecting right. and scattering uh, of different things. So uh, uh, that otherwise everything would be dark basically. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, we see things because light is bouncing around mm -hmm. and then finally hit our eyes. Mm -hmm. And, and what you're doing is basically that you want to manipulate what bounces back or... Yes, in, in some of our research we want to manipulate what bounces back, like what, what you perceive. Uh, mm. So uh, we work quite a lot on that actually, to create color mm. using structure uh, for new types of displays and other things. Um, but there is um, there are other other types of interactions too, where it's not based on what you see. And that can be instead that you use light to control a chemical reaction or, or other things. So it's not only about what you see, but it's also about what happens in a system when light is present. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I had a look at your website and you talk about uh, non-optical phenomena, I guess that's what you just described, right? And you well, also talk... Ah. Yeah, yeah, I guess I, <laughs> I didn't take, uh, describe it in, in, in a very good way, maybe, or, or not in very detail, at least. So, uh, But that's true. So, so we, we, we use uh, nanostructures to control light, and when you have a structure that is very small, it can behave very differently from if you have, have a large structure. When the structure, like a particle, if you have a ball and you shrink it so that it has a size that is similar to the, the wavelengths of the light itself, so the color of light. Mm -hmm. And what is that? What size the, is that? Uh, so that would be, let's say, 10 to a few hundred nanometers in mm -hmm. size. Mm -hmm. At those dimensions, when when the geometry has similar dimension to the wavelengths of the light, uh, then you get new effects appearing. Uh, it can be interference effects, 
uh, what you can see for example on uh, thin uh, oil surfaces on, on the water that's why you get colors from those normal interference effects you mean when you get you get like different colors in like rings or yeah exactly yeah, that's the yeah. interference you're talking about yeah that's that's mm -hmm. the type of thin film interference effect mm -hmm. which occurs because you have one dimension at the same scale as the wavelengths of light so at the mm -hmm. nanoscale mm -hmm. but we often use uh, also other dimensions so shrink shrink also the other dimensions to get really truly nanostructures nanoparticles and if you make those structures of metal they get very interesting optical properties so a metal has uh, uh, different it behaves very different from from a, from a dielectric material in terms of how it interacts with light so if you shine light on a piece of uh, glass okay i have a, <laughs> a, a water glass here yeah. uh, light will go through it will uh, maybe change angle a little bit but it can penetrate through but light cannot go through a uh, a, a good metal instead it will reflect very well so mm -hmm. uh, that's why uh, we use metals to make mirrors for example they're very shiny we call it even metallic surfaces uh, mm -hmm. because it it looks very reflective mm -hmm. the reason why it is very reflective is because it has a has a permittivity that is negative which uh, in in more simpler ways to say that is that uh, the refractive index of the material is uh, has a large imaginary component which okay maybe that was not simpler <laughs> but the same <laughs> this the same property is what what makes a nanoparticle of metal strongly interact with light so if you have a nanoparticle of of, uh, of metal like gold or, or silver the light will come with an oscillating electric field, uh, same oscillation uh, frequency as, as the wavelengths of the light. Mm -hmm. And the electrons in the metal will, will feel this electric field, this oscillating electric field, and can respond to it. Uh, so it can, they can start to move in resonance with the oscillating light field. And uh, at certain colors or certain frequencies, there can be a resonance of this behavior, such as light is strongly scattered or absorbed. And, and you're saying that this will only happen if you have the nanostructure. It won't happen if you have, if you had the same material in, a, in like a big flat surface. It that's right. Happen. No, that's that's right. So this happens because of the op optical properties of a particle that has the same size uh, or similar size as the light itself. Okay. In combination with it being a metal, then, then these things can occur. But you can get other interesting effects also if you have a flat metal film that is related to that, but it's, it's not the same exactly. Okay. So there are quite many different things that you can play with. Uh, around light interacting with surfaces and materials depending on the type of material and the structure size or whatever exactly so you can then change the size uh, the shape of the structure or which metal it is to control in more in detail how, how light interact with it and for example if you have a metal sphere of gold and it, and it's a uh, maybe it could be 50 nanometers in diameter or something like that, it will scatter green color quite well. Uh, but if you would make it elongated, uh, change its shape, then you will change that color of the structure. And that is actually, it's not, it, that is nothing new. So that is, has been used since the medieval times or even earlier actually to, to color glass. Okay, so, really? so the, co the concept of stained glass is actually from having metallic nanoparticles embedded in the glass and they scatter color because of this phenomenon mm -hmm. it's it's called pl plasmons that you excite in the in the particles okay perhaps this is not it's beyond the scope of this conversation maybe but i'm just curious to know how they would even make those nanoparticles in the medieval times yeah that, that's uh, uh, me <laughs> i i don't know I, I don't know that in detail but i think i i think so it's quite uh, it's quite straightforward to make nanoparticles 
on a by synthesizing it from from salts that mm -hmm. contains the metal. I'm not sure right now actually if that is how they did it or if they started by really grinding. I think mm -hmm. it was. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, especially since the the size is probably. I mean, it needs to be this exact size if you're gonna have the green or the blue or whatever you're you're saying. So I mean, if you're just grinding particles, you would have all sorts of sizes probably. Right? So yeah, that's 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 right, and and uh, different shapes also, which even more control controls the color. Uh -huh. um, but it's quite amazing that they they could do this, and there are even examples from the Roman times. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the fourth century, there is a, there is a, there was made a famous glass cup. It's called the Lycurgus cup, which which has this phenomenon, and it um, it looks green when you look at it uh, just by letting light scatter from it or reflect from it. Mm -hmm. But if you put the light source behind the cup, it appears really a nice red color instead, mm -hmm. and that is because the green light has been removed from what you see, and you only see what is left. Uh, which uh, going through your eyes. Isn't this the same phenomenon that, that you would I guess if you had chlorophyll in a beaker of water or something? I because I vaguely remember doing an experiment like that uh, in you know high school or something. Uh, yeah. We had mm -hmm. uh, we had like a beaker. I think it was chlorophyll in water, and you would illuminate it. I mean, if you looked at it from the front, it looked green. But then if you looked illuminated it and you looked at it from the back or vice versa, I don't exactly remember. It looked like red, like deep red. Yeah. No, but it, it's uh, uh, some of the physics is the same. Uh, the fact that uh, you have something that removes the green light or scatters the green light. And therefore, if you look at scattered light, it looks green. Mm -hmm. But if you instead look at kind of what is left, uh, if, if you look at transmitted light, uh, mm -hmm. then the re green light would be removed instead. Right, and it's it's the same phenomenon that makes the the sky blue also, and 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 why the why the sun turns more and more red when it goes to the horizon. It's also about the blue light being scattered away so that the sun looks more red. It's a okay. different process of scattering than in mm. chlorophyll or mm. in our nanoparticles, but the, the let's say the the final result that you get different colors. Mm has a lot of similarities. Okay, so um, I mean, so let's talk a bit more about what it is that you do with light in your research. Okay, yes, so we, we, we are very interested in understanding how light interacts with nanostructures, so very small structures. So these are, let's say, a, a nanostructure of of 100 nanometers, typically like 100 to 1,000 times smaller than the width of a, of a human hair. So, so it's quite small things, and we make it make these systems to partly f from a fundamental point of view, but also with uh, certain applications in mind. Uh, I already mentioned, I think, uh, displays. So different types of displays. That is an uh, interesting direction, I, I think, where we create the coloration from reflected light and getting getting different colors due to nanostructures and, and different interference effects. The idea in that in that direction is to make uh, paper-like displays. So not this displays that emit color, but instead that you see colors because of how light in the room or, or from the sun scatters and reflected by, by the structure. So okay, it would so, be like a piece so of a paper. No, yeah, so a normal display you're saying is emitting light. Yes, it and produces the light. It produces the light, okay. Yeah. And, we, and we, what you're designing now is using light from the outside. Exactly. So, so there are certain... There are these type of, of devices you can buy already, but they are typically in grayscale. Mm -hmm. It's uh, electronic paper or uh, electronic readers uh, that w work quite well, for example, in sunlight, where a normal display doesn't work uh, at all. And, and they use much less energy mm -hmm. because they don't have to produce the light. They only have to maintain the picture 
So it's like a like a writing on a piece of paper, mm. but then you can also change what is written on there electrically. That is kind of the what we want to do in color. Okay. So, but how how would you use this? Would it be for like ebooks or tablets or? Yes. Yeah. Those oh. those type of applications. Uh, we also foresee that it can be used for things like advertisement boards uh, on bus stops or things like that, where you want mm -hmm. to uh, ch change the images that you produce, maybe not extremely quickly. Mm -hmm. But actually, our collaborators that are at, at Chalmers uh, in uh, Professor Dalin's group, they are, have also shown that it may actually be possible to reach uh, video rate with these systems. Okay. And then you can really start to think of competing with uh, things like iPads or uh, different type of uh, emissive displays. Mm -hmm. And then the you could get like color images. That's what you're saying. Yes. With this as well. So so what is it that you're doing? I mean, what what questions are you asking, or what problems are you solving, or yeah, yeah. In, in that particular direction, uh, there are um, let's say many fundamental questions that arise based on let's say performances that we want in order to get those type of displays and one is that we need to have very high reflectance the brightness need to be very high so in a em em normal emissive display if it looks a little bit dim you can always crank up the power and get more light out but if you have a so-called reflective display you you'd only have the light that is in the surrounding to, to play with. So it's important that they are really using the light in, in an effective way. So that is one of the, let's say, challenges. So we are trying then to design new types of optical cavities or nanostructures that can create vibrant colors, so colors of good quality, but also with, with high absolute reflectance so that mm -hmm. we don't, so that we lose as few photons as possible. Mm -hmm. What was the cavity you said? No. So a, so a cavity is uh, uh, different words on the same thing sometimes, but it's a little bit broader concept than, uh, than these metallic nanostructures that I, we talked about before. So a, a cavity can also be, for example, a layered structure where you have different materials layered on top of each other and due to interference effects between light reflected at different or scattered at different interfaces that creates colors mm -hmm. so that is called a cavity it can be called a cavity if light bouncing back and forth in these systems to sort of capture the light of certain wavelengths mm -hmm. so would you, would you have to have one type of structure for each wavelength then or how would it work? Yes, good question. So um, we have shown that that is, that is possible to make, let's say, very good colors with different structures, which slightly changes di the dimensions, for example. But we are also working on, on uh, which I th I'm quite excited about, we're working on, on a few different approaches to actually have a, a pixel that can change its color instead. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's actually important because if you have these uh, different colors put next to each other on the surface, then each color can also can only occupy maximum one third of the of the area of your device. If what? it's if it's a three color system oh, like red, right. red, green, blue. Yeah. So that means that if you want to produce red you have to turn off the other colors and that means that the maximum reflectance that you can get is actually only 33 percent all right so if we can instead have pixels that change color then we can gain a lot and can you well yes we have <laughs> we have a pre preliminary data that is promising uh, we have still challenges to overcome to make a, let's say devices that you can buy in, in the in the store uh, in terms of like say st stability uh, reproducibility and uh, things like that but uh, yes uh, it looks quite promising i would say so so actually you're 
you have designed then a pixel that can be either red, green, or or blue, and yes, no and color in between. I mean, it's just no, like those also distinct. in between, also, also in between. between. Yeah. Aha. Yeah. Okay. So how is that controlled? Uh, in a few different ways. So we have uh, together with the same group at, at Chalmers, uh, we have a system where we change the optical properties of a material back and forth and in a continuous way also oh, and that can okay. gradually change the the resonance condition of the cavities which means that the, we change the color of the cavity back and forth mm -hmm. okay that that's fascinating it's a bit difficult to sort of picture how it happens <laughs> but but uh, well, how well, uh, if I can give an example, then uh, it could be that uh, it's not exactly maybe how we how we had it now, but one could have two mirrors and one let light through a little bit. So it's uh, partially transparent and that is a typical cavity. And then depending on what you have inside and also the thickness between the mirrors, it will determine which color comes back out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if we can then change what we have inside or the optical properties of what's inside or the difference in thickness, oh, okay. then we can then we can tune the color. Okay, oh, that's, that's straightforward. It is quite straightforward. Uh, it's quite challenging practi practically to, to get good results. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm, I'm just thinking like how many pixels do you need? Uh, and you, then you need to control each of those and... Uh -huh. Yeah, and that is uh, that is another chapter of, of the challenges, let's say. So uh, I'm, I'm a physicist myself, so I'm coming, let's say, from the perspective of uh, understanding how we can control or, or vary the properties of the cavities to get good colors and change it. Uh, but then we have to collaborate with, let's say, chemists to, to have changeable materials and then also engineers and uh, like electrical engineers also on how to then implement actually tuning of arrays of these systems. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so, so this is a fairly applied project, I would say, right? Or It, it, is, it is a fairly applied project. It ha I think it has uh, applications that one can uh, quite easily see how it will be used uh, in everyone's home or like, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. But, but it also raises fundamental research questions that are really interesting. So in a different project, which, which is part of that direction, we made another type of optical cavity system and uh, they were use optical simulations to try to understand exactly why do we get these colors? What do they come from? What type of optical phenomena occurs in these nanoscale systems. So it goes hand in hand, I think. Mm, and and, those, and that, simu yeah. those simulations, were they I mean, computer simulations or? How? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we, uh, in, in most of our projects, maybe not all, but in most of our projects, we, we try to combine experiments with simulations that we do in, on a computer on to try to uh, both to design structures actually so we can first make the structure in the computer and uh, to see what is promising to, to actually fabricate because it can be quite challenging to make these structures or and time consuming uh, experimental in the lab so that is one part of it but also we sometimes make structures and we want to better understand why they work as, as they do so why do they produce the type of optical colors that we see, uh, what actually happens there inside each layer and inside the nanostructure, that we can reveal using optical simulations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so you, I mean, you mentioned several different applications in your website. You said, I think you mentioned also energy harvesting. Is that something that you work on now or is that a, an old yeah, project? That, we, we partly work on that now, uh, maybe in a bit different way from what we did before. So, so we have worked on, let's say, making structures that uh, 
don't care so much about how they look like, let's say for displays, but instead, how can we efficiently uh, or non-efficiently sometimes, but how, we, how can we convert solar light to electrical energy or to thermal energy and change between different energy forms? Mm -hmm. That is something that we have worked on a bit. But now we are interested also in a different energy related application. And that is a bit different. So that is, is that related to, to cooling? So how to cool objects using optical properties and in more detail, how to use thermal radiation to cool objects. So uh, the sun looks bright because it's very hot. And the uh, hot objects, they emit thermal radiation. Uh, they, they send out light, um, just like an old-fashioned light bulb, because it is, has, a, has a high temperature. But also objects that are at room temperature also emit light, but, a diff but at a different wavelength, at much longer wavelengths. So that is beyond what we can see. So uh, objects like ourselves or animals they can be viewed in dark, in complete darkness, using thermal cameras instead of normal cameras. Right, we've and seen they... those in movies, right? Where you... in movies, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh. yeah, maybe that's where we usually see them, or maybe in some uh, science museums or in other other places too. Mm. Uh, but the reason why we can ob ob observe or detect humans with thermal cameras is that they emit light at uh, much longer wavelengths than what the eyes can see. So around mm -hmm. 10 micrometer. Mm -hmm. and, and this emission, you, you remove energy when, when you have this emission. So what, what we are using now is to use this phenomena of thermal radiation of objects that are at room temperature and sending out energy to space, which is much colder. So space is really, really, really cold. And the, the, the difference in temperature between space and Earth can actually be used uh, to remove energy by the same type of radiation as you see for hot objects. So we use space as a, as a heat sink, one can say. How? How, How does it work? <laughs> what yeah. is it that you do? It, it, I, I know that it, it, it may sound a bit science fiction-like, but it's, <laughs> but it's actually something that occurs for all objects. So, so it's just that we can try to optimize it and make it as efficient as possible. It is also not something that is completely new, although I would say that it has taken a renewed interest in, in, a, in, in our community, in the science community, partially because we find new types of materials that can do these things efficiently and we can control the materials in new ways. But anyway, so uh, this has, for example, been used to, to create, to make ice, actually, during nighttime. Mm -hmm. So, so there, I, I'm not an expert on this, but I think uh, in, in uh, Middle East, uh, as example, they have uh, had, had uh, pools, like uh, swimming pools, but uh, for, for, for thin layers of water. And then um, they cool down during nighttime partially because of this type of radiation that always occur for, from different materials. And uh, I ho hope that's not completely wrong now, because that's not my expertise area exactly. But it's just an example of that the concept is not exactly new. That has been done for, for a long time. But what is what is more new is that we, we're trying to do this at also at daytime, when the sun is out. And that is really challenging because if you expose objects to the sun, they usually heat up because they absorb part of the sunlight. So we're trying to make materials that very efficiently avoids heating from the sun and at the same time have this thermal radiation, which all objects do, but to have that in an efficient way to then remove energy by thermal radiation, which is infrared light emission out to the cold space. But how can you, I mean, the, as you said, or you mentioned that the, the emission or the radiation, it, it's always there for all physical bodies. Yeah. 
And how can you then make that more efficient, the radiation? Yeah, so the radiation is, um, it's called Planck radiation. And we maybe are familiar with concept like uh, a perfect black body radiator. That is kind of the optimum system which, which, uh, where you have maximized efficiency. The efficiency at which objects do that, uh, have this e emission, is related actually to how much it can absorb inf light in the same wavelengths, infrared mm -hmm. light. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we can maximize the absorption of a material, so it absorbs all infrared light in a certain region, then it will also have maximized its efficiency to radiate, uh, have this thermal radiation. Okay. And then how how would you use this in the end? Would it be instead of air condition? Yes. Or... So that it, yeah, that is one of the driving forces in this field now. And um, there are some startup companies uh, also, at least, for example, in the US, trying to make, um, let's say, coatings to use on roofs. Uh, which will be very white because they have to, uh, or the idea is that they will avoid solar heating, <laughs> but then have this additional possibility of, of uh, radiative cooling, it's called, to actually lower its temperature to below that of the air that surrounds the material. So it gets mm -hmm. sub-ambient cooling, it's called. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, you mentioned the, uh, <clears throat> the IR cameras that you can use to see people in the dark, mm. basically. And I was thinking that basically then in theory, if, you, if you're wearing some something that sort of prevents the heat from radiating, then you would not be as visible, right? Yeah, yeah. That's it. it's, uh, it's nice that you bring that up because manipulating light at these wavelength ranges in the infrared that is also a big area for camouflage. Oh, uh -huh, okay, is it? Yeah. Okay, I wasn't aware. Yeah. Mm. But that brings me to another topic that I've okay. been looking <laughs> forward to ask you, and that's about the invisibility cloak. Oh yeah. Because I read on your website you had this chapter from a book that you've been uh, writing. Uh, it's called the Kaleidoscope of Knowledge. I think it's only available in Swedish, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, there you mentioned this invisibility cloak, which is not something that you work on, but which you described. So I'm just so curious to learn more about how this works. I think it's such an intriguing idea to, to be able to gain such a superpower, <laughs> which seems yeah, yeah. possible, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't it, isn't it intriguing? I, I think so too. Uh, it's uh, partly why I write about that as an example of what you can do with, with nanostructures or... or at least in the future, mm -hmm. uh, in that book chapter. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's a pop popular science book chapter. Um, uh, it's a book made by the Young Academy of Sweden, and it's unfortunately only in Swedish at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so invisibility cloaking. It's I guess it's one of the dreams of how to manipulate light to make things really invisible. And the the way that they they will will work is that they they in total control light so that light in incident on, on, on something, when it comes out from the something or goes around the, that object, it will have the same type of uh, direction and uh, properties as if the object would not be there. Uh, mm -hmm. So that is, that is kind of the, the essence of it, that, that the light should behave the same if the object is there or if the object is not there. And one of the strategies to trying to, to fix this uh, is by using nanostructures to create materials with optical properties that don't even exist in, in nature, mm -hmm. uh, at least to, to, to our knowledge. Uh, maybe, I mean, there are lots of interesting nanoscale optical phenomena actually in nature, but a material property, it doesn't exist as a material properties, but maybe nature has also found ways to make structures that create these properties. I don't want to uh, exclude that possibility because we have learned so much from nature on, on uh, nano, nano optics actually. Anyway, so one, one such uh, property would then be that uh, 
I, if I take the glass again, if you have light impinging on, on a glass uh, surface, it will change its direction slightly uh, if it goes into the water, uh, which is why it's difficult to see exactly where things are if you look into water. And, and this is called refraction. And with uh, nanostructures, you can create so-called negative refraction. You can create a system where using nanoscale structures, they together make the material refract light in a way that is called negative. So that means that if light goes from, from one in, across an interface here, from let's say, in a normal case, it could be air to water, it will have a one certain angle and then we change the angle a little bit. Okay, uh, but with a negative refraction, it will go backwards instead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like there was an interface like that, ah. <laughs> that it reflects on, but it's not. Yeah. So that's called negative refraction. And that is, a, could be part of, of uh, what, what is needed to create this type of invisibility cloaks. Actually, it has been shown. It has been shown uh, that it's possible to, to make small structures in, invisible using this concept, but it's, challenging to, to, to make it at large scale. It's challenging to make it work for different colors. So mm. usually it's not very broadband, but maybe works for, let's say, green light, but you can still mm. see the object if you use red light. Uh, but but it's it's really so cool. And, um, I mean, if you wore this, people would only see maybe the blue parts of you, but not the red parts. Uh, yeah, I mean, or, or it depends on what light or... that is what the light is shining on you. Also, yeah, maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. you maybe you will uh, look blue instead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah I'm not I... really an expert on, on that, but it, it's a really uh, interesting possible future thing that you find in things like Harry Potter uh, cloaks, right? So yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it was and, and, it's yeah. fascinating, fascinating idea, and, yeah. and maybe it will be possible at some point. So, yeah. <clears throat> so you talked about some some challenges already. I mean, are there what are the biggest challenges with the work that you do? Yeah, good question. So, I guess that uh, that can be answered depending on a, a little bit different perspectives or aspects. And uh, I think we work quite a lot with with, uh, with quite novel type of organic materials. So, so one, let's say, practical as, aspect uh, uh, ch challenge in that respect is that uh, we know more, much less about them than conventional materials, which is just also, uh, of course, a lot of, of the fun and why we want to do this. But uh, so we we uh, polymerize materials uh, and uh, can change their properties. And one challenge then is to to understand why they get the properties that they, they actually get. One challenge is to design the material so that they get the properties that we want. And I mentioned before that we, we really like to do experiments and simulations hand in hand. And if we want to understand what's happening, we, want, we need to know the basic material properties of the things we're using so that we can use that in the computer simulations uh, to, to predict what's happening. That is very easy, or let's, easy, relatively easy, if you work with materials that are really well known, like gold or silver. They, they are tabulated data for their optical properties, their refractive index, let's say. For our materials, one of the challenges is to first determine what optical properties do they actually have. And mm -hmm. Only after that, we can start to understand uh, what what they can, what we can do with them when we make them at the nanoscale. So, so how do you do that? I mean, how do you determine then the optical properties? Are there straightforward ways to do it? Straightforward maybe is uh, a, a bit too optimistic, <laughs> but, but, there, but there are ways definitely. So we have very good collaborators on this also using ellipsometry. Mm -hmm. So we use ellipsometry to uh, which works that you, you have light at a fixed or, or, or a controlled polarization that hits your surface at a certain angle. And then you look at the reflection of light at, at different polarizations. And then you can get a lot of information about uh, your, your materials. 
uh, you do that also at different angles and uh, across a wide spectral range also to get then the optical properties in in uh, at different ranges that we're interested in yeah. so so it's possible uh, but it's not easy and uh, it, it requires quite a lot of uh, thinking and and uh, fiddling with parameters to to get it right mm. so there are challenges for sure um so what fascinates you or inspires you with this work? Because you're still in it, even though it seems pretty difficult, parts oh, of it at least. <laughs> well, well, I would say that I'm probably in it be because it is difficult. Uh, actually, otherwise, it, if it would not be a little bit challenging, it, I think it would be uh, less fun also. So so the, the fact that it's part of it is, is tricky is also... It's related also to that there are a lot of things that we don't know, and and, and that that is what drives me a lot, uh, motivates me that that there are so many new questions, uh, research questions, that we can try to address using these type of materials. So we we work a lot with the a type of materials called uh, organic conducting polymers. So mm -hmm. it's uh, like plastics. But uh, not like a normal piece of plastic uh, that we are used to, but instead materials that can conduct electricity. Mm -hmm. So it's plastic that can conduct electricity. Uh, like a metal, almost, or, or let's say in analogy with, with, with conventional metals. And that's why we're also interested in, okay, can these materials behave like metals when we shine light on them? And then we start to make this type of nanostructures and see, can we get the same type of phenomena, but in an organic polymer instead of a conventional metal? And do they behave like metals? I mean, are they reflecting light, for example? Or... They, they do in, in different, in some wavelength ranges. Oh, okay. So we, we showed, I think it was last year, that you can actually excite this same type of resonances as in a gold particle in this type of polymers but in the near infrared, slightly outside what we what we can see. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that that is fascinating, certainly. Uh, so yep. yeah, you mentioned <laughs> I think so. also. Yeah, go ahead. You were going to add something there, or? Uh, well, uh, not sure. Well, I, I guess maybe it was clear already that that, that is because I think you you all asked sort of what what motivates us and why do we do it, although it's still difficult. So it's a uh, I'm really uh, motivated by, the, by finding out what, what's actually happening in these systems. And about, so it's a curiosity-related uh, motivation, let's say. Although we are quite close to applications in the end too, so we, we do want to um, go... We want to start from, at the fundamental level and then work all the way to applications and, and then back again to understand also what actually happens in the applications. Yeah, because that was also a question I was going to ask you. you. You mentioned that you work both with the applied and the fundamental. And why, I mean, why do you do both? I mean, I, I think, wouldn't it be more straightforward or easier to just do one of them? I mean, why do you do both and how do you even balance between the two? I mean, why do you see the need to do both fundamental and applied? I I uh, I am a, a strong promoter of fundamental science and applied science, but I think in general fundamental science need more promotion because it's less obvious maybe uh, the, the need. So I think all applied science that we do in my lab and in other labs, it could not be done without the fundamental science. We would not even know what to do. Uh, we would not have the tools to fabricate our structures. We would not have the understanding of what happens with light at the nanoscale. We would not have the simulation programs to, to uh, predict what's going to happen and so on. So it really goes hand in hand, I think, applied and fundamental science. From a personal perspective, I, I, I like both. Uh, but I think in order to do the applied, our research becomes so much better if we can also do fundamental science and better understand what happens in, in our applications. Mm. So the applications become better and uh, more new if we also do the fundamental science. Uh, 
Mm. And the fundamental science then, on the other hand, I'm thinking if it actually benefits from the applied side, I, I, I guess to some extent, maybe a little bit less, but uh, for sure it, it benefits from tools that, that are developed, which is maybe a different branch of science also. Uh, otherwise, maybe it, it's, it's less obvious. So, so what do you think the future looks like for this area? I mean, area where you use optical phenomena or light interacting with surfaces, which yeah. seems, I mean, there are so many applications It's everything. Here. <laughs> it's everything. Yeah, exactly. it's everything. And we all, all only touched upon a few, actually, of, the, of directions, even in my group. And, uh, of course, if you expand this to, to the whole optics community, it, there is so much more. Uh, I, I think photonics and, and uh, optics is really important. And it has been so also since, let's say, the beginning of time. <laughs> how how the, the the possibility to control light uh, and uh, produce light and and uh, focus light to magnif make microscopes, etc. It's 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 so important for us. I think it will continue to to do that in uh, many different ways. Energy harvesting, sure, uh, but also in in uh, yes to make. Or just uh, to, to, to make uh, life uh, more advanced and better with the new types of displays, uh, holograms, uh, 3D systems, as well as new tools also. So, so it's not only about making optical applications and things that like a display, but light can also be used quite a lot in, in other research, let's say. So for example, when you have when you have a light beam and you focus it to a small spot, like in a microscope or with a lens, you get optical forces also on objects. So light can actually induce forces on objects too. And uh, and that, that can be used to, to use light to grab a small particle, a micro particle, mm -hmm. that is not easy to grab with the no normal tweezers. Uh, but with light, you can grab it without actually any physical things attached to it. In three dimensions, move it around, and uh, measure things. Uh, this, this is called optical tweezers. It was awarded with the Nobel Prize in physics a few years ago, mm -hmm. partly because of how important it is in biological research. So that is one example that the ability to understand and, and use control light is used in completely different fields and help uh, us to understand better about the body and, and uh, find better drugs or, or, or whatever. So, so, so it's, it's quite broad. Mm. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, how many things you can actually do with, with light, so many more things than you could even imagine. I mean, manipulate objects, you can heat and cool. I mean, of yep. course you can see things. And I mean, you talked about electricity converting energy from one form to the other. So, so many areas. Uh... There are many areas. Uh, computing is another one. <laughs> Making quantum computing with, with photons, with light. Uh, uh -huh. that, that is one uh, direction. We are not working on that ourselves, but I think it's qu quite exciting. Mm -hmm. It's been a lot of interesting progress. Uh, understanding and investigating different quantum effects in general is also light quite useful there to look at let's things like quantum entanglement and stuff like that so um, it's really broad and all the way from helping to understand fundamental things to to very applied things mm -hmm. so the future is looking bright i guess it is. <laughs> that, that's the conclusion and that there are so many things still to discover um, yes there is, yeah, so exactly. So we, we've talked about a few examples, but I, I'm also curious about all, all the things that we haven't even thought of. Uh, so mm -hmm. that is usually how it happens uh, in, in 10, 20 years. Maybe we are doing research with light that we didn't couldn't even imagine today. So that's kind of what I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's hope. Yeah, so I, I think we will stop the conversation there. Uh, it's been super interesting to talk about light interacting with matter. Uh, so thank you everyone for listening to this episode with me, Marlene Edvardsson and Magnus Jonsson, uh, professor at Lidköping University. 
And I would also like to take the opportunity to mention to those of you who are listening or watching that if you're interested in surface science or related topics, you should check out our blog, the Surface Science blog. Thank you.